is from Macquarie University in Australia, and he has a lot of experience working with frontline teachers as well as faculty staff from different subject academic disciplines. So I'm sure we're all going to learn a lot from him, uh, from his perspective, right? Uh, uh, his experience in developing online assessment, right, for various disciplines. So uh, without further ado, perhaps Matthew? <laughs> Yep, thanks for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be virtually visiting Hong Kong yet again. Um, it's one of my um, old stomping grounds. I worked on, on and off in Hong Kong many years ago um, and always enjoy visiting, <laughs> enjoying the food and shopping and things like that. Um, now you can find these slides. Uh, there's, a, there's a link in that I've just put in the text chat um, and you'll be able to also download various different uh, resources, documents and things like that, web page links. Uh, that we will go through in this presentation and there'll be some activity, interactive activities, etc. as well. Okay, so let's get started. This session is looking at, I suppose, the shift. Um, COVID-19 has certainly brought about a shift um, of teaching. Um, never before have so many learning designers been so involved in so many projects um, in universities around the world at the moment. Um, it's, I'm sure it's the same in Hong Kong. It's certainly the case in Australia. Um, despite the fact that we have very little COVID left in the country, many people are still not wanting to go to campus. Um, so the online, I think, it is with us um, for, for a good, you know, medium period of time. And in fact, I've noticed our students are starting to prefer it. Um, in, the, in the first half of the year, our semester one, our students were saying, oh no, we, this was, you know, March, April, that sort of thing. Can we please go back to the campus? This online learning is horrible. Uh, I miss my friends. And then when we start in our um, uh, July, August, September, this period of time, we asked our students again, now it's flipped around the other way. Uh, do I really have to commute three hours across Sydney to get to campus? Can I just do this at home? Yay! <laughs> so um, our students are now preferring to be working in the online mode. Um, quite, quite in the majority, I would say that two thirds to three quarters of our students are now preferring to be online, even though we have partially reopened the campus and students can go for tutorials and practicals and things like that. Um, but they're certainly voting with their feet at the moment, which means there's obvious flow on effects to the way we design our courses, the way we design our assessment. Uh, next slide for me. Okay. Now, a lot of my work over the years has been focused on digital assessment and particular um, online examinations, but I'm going to speak in more broad terms this time. And a lot of the motivation for this work is what I get, consider this gap, this, this growing huge gap um, that's getting worse and worse by the minute in the sense that um, many assessments traditionally have been, as per the pic picture on the right, um, large um, exam halls. That's actually a photograph from uh, the Monash University examination hall. There are three floors of the building uh, that look just like this with exams stretching. I mean, the curvature of the earth starts kicking in. You see, look at the end of the room, right? It's that big. Um, with, they hire out the Caulfield horse racing track to run their exams. <laughs> um, so we're talking about a university with 70,000 students um, and a good number of those, probably 50 to 60,000 of those are on the main campuses in Melbourne and they have to run high stakes assessments at the end of the semester for many units. And other universities, of course, are the same. Um, when I was at University of New South Wales, they also, as it happened, hired out the Randwick race course to run their examinations in, in the betting halls. Um, maybe you would like to try asking the Hong Kong Jockey Club whether they want to borrow you a, a racetrack to run your exams. Um, but yes, this idea of pen on paper assessment being a way that students, uh, essentially that this is the method they're given to demonstrate their best you know, demonstrate they know what they're talking about. They know how to solve problems. They know how to think. They know how to be critical. Um, they know how to speak and write and do computer programming and engineering and all the rest of it. Um, the high stakes part of the assessment is still a piece of paper and a pen. I mean, my argument would be that that doesn't really give the students the, the space, the, the pedagogical landscape, as it were, to be able to demonstrate their best. Um, so there's growing disconnect between, you know, the real world of work, if you want to call it that, practice, professions, how people work and play and, you know, socialise these days is frequently mediated by technology. 
um, or there are technology tools involved in that process. Um, even people like, you know, carpenters and bricklayers and plumbers and electricians, they all use computers to administer their small businesses, um, you know, for work planning, all sorts of things. So technology is really embedded in many things, uh, many professions, many trades. Um, I mean, what, from your point of view, you guys are all language teachers. So, you know, what, what do you think of this proposition? Um, you're welcome if you, if you don't disagree, if you disagree with this, you're welcome to say so. Type into the text chat. Um, I think there's also this idea of 21st century skills, um, you know, complexity, communications, group work, uh, as I said, technology mediation. Um, and of course, the coming fourth industrial revolution where things like robotics and artificial intelligence and machine learning is going to have an impact upon workplaces, study, assessment. I mean, think about what we can do these days with, you know, automated marking is starting to arrive. Uh, it's certainly the, around with selected response items, but, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence could well come along. Um, it's certainly doing things like, um, uh, producing a better language translation. It's doing things like uh, very rudimentary essay writing on your behalf. You put some topics into a machine learning algorithm, it spits out something that looks like a, you know, a poorly written essay. Um, that will only improve in time. So these sorts of tools um, are going to be around. They're going to be increasingly around. It's going to impact what we teach, how we teach, how we assess, etc. Uh, oops, didn't press that button, page down. Now, we're thinking about where we're heading with all of this argument is we want, I guess, assessment, online learning to be meaningful and in my mind, authentic. Um, so these ideas that, that, you know, assessment has to be contrived, I think is, I'm hoping most people kind of, um, you know, agree with the idea that ideally, if we want to engage students, if we want to make our, our education relevant for our students and their futures, then assessment is a big part of that. I mean, it's, it's a large part of the curriculum as far as a student is concerned is the assessment. Um, you know, I think, again, hopefully most people are starting to recognize that now, um, which means reform in assessment, I think, is an important area. Um, so again, active, intentional, authentic, cooperative, constructive. These are all those, I mean, social constructivist perspective on, on teaching and learning on assessment. When we think about authentic, we've got authentic context, things like simulations, for example, or workplace learning, um, authentic activities, expert performance. We're aiming to produce professionals. We're aiming to produce, well, at least functional um, individuals in their future professions. Um, and, you know, language teaching is certainly an enabler to allow those students to succeed in their future. I can't imagine, you know, somebody studying in a English medium instruction university who's got really poor English and then going to study engineering. Well, you have to be able to read, write and speak and everything to communicate. Um, employers expect teamwork, you know, employers expect communication. So I think a lot of these skills, particularly from, you know, what you guys are doing with upskilling people's English language is critical for our students' future success. Um, and the kinds of assessments that at least I'm going to argue here is, is that we need to be looking at things that are, you know, of course, rigorous as well, but also very relevant to what they're going to be doing. Another idea that I'm pushing, I guess, is this idea of technology as an enabler. Uh, enable us to do things that we couldn't do before. Um, it's, whilst it's also reflective of future professional practice in the teaching context, it's also an enable. It's a human capability multiplier in the professions, um, but it also allows us to do things that we could not do before. Um, uh, you know, recent uh, Nobel Prizes in uh, um, well, the computational chemistry and computational biology tells us that the role of information technology is creeping into all sorts of different discipline areas. Um, so this idea that technology can be used in simple ways, i.e. we can substitute it, we can turn a paper and pencil multiple choice qu uh, quiz into a computerized multiple choice quiz. Now, it, from, a, from a student's perspective, there's not a lot of difference. You're filling in bubbles or you're clicking mouses. So that's what substitution, augmentation, of course, is we take it and we do some functional improvements to it. 
um, we may be able to, for example, have automated feedback. So now the student presses the button, they press the wrong option, and the system gives them formative feedback that says, hey, this is not quite right. It's a common misconception. Maybe you should try again. Um, whereas with old fashioned multiple choice pen and paper tests, you couldn't really do that in a viable way. Whereas with online multiple choice questions, you can certainly do that. Um, augmentation can also be things like um, in health sciences, uh, using full high definition color images of histology slides, for example. Uh, it allows you to zoom in, whereas the old paper printed black and white or even printed paper, the resolution just wasn't really a, a high enough to make, to make that assessment task um, viable to that extent. You had to produce, provide a lot of expensive equipment so that people could, could interact with those objects. Now we have you know, digital histology, uh, digital tools that we can have a digital uh, microscope that they can zoom into. Um, you know, in language teaching, we can augment with videos and audio files. Um, and then we go up the hill. Let's just go right to redefinition. Simulations, for example. Um, I'll show you an example of some of this stuff later. Uh, modification can be things like um, uh, virtual work integrated learning. There's an example of that one coming as well. So this SAMAR model, I'm not sure how many people have heard of SAMAR before. Uh, it's a practitioner developed framework. Um, but in my mind, it's, uh, whilst it, it wasn't an academic produced model, it was, a, it, it was practitioner developed. But what I like about it is it's, it's a sort of a, a easy way of sort of understanding the impact and the change in things like curriculum as a result of the introduction of technology or the application of technology to, to the task. Uh, page down. The other issue, of course, is the idea of which comes first, the chicken or the egg, <laughs> the horse or the cart, um, the technology or the pedagogy. <laughs> now, uh, many people you will notice uh, like shiny things. <laughs> you know, they, they, a new toy comes along um, and they think, oh my gosh, how can I use a blog or a wiki or a, a Snapchat or whatever it is in my teaching, right? You know, put up your hand if you've been tempted to play with toys, yeah? <laughs> no, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself, right? But the problem is with doing it that way is, is and it can happen when, you know, when you've got too many people that are IT uh, driving, driving the strategy in an institution is where technologies can sometimes come before, why are we using this technology in this teaching context? So um, I think a valuable framework to help think about the different uh, pieces of knowledge that teachers and educators and learning designers and indeed people who run universities um, need to know about is, you know, they've got to consider the discipline. There's always context involved here. Um, you know, what works for language teachers is probably not going to work for medical or physics or some other discipline. There'll be some variations on the way you apply the technology and the teaching techniques that are best applied. Um, then we have pedagogical um, knowledge. So the combination of content and pedagogical knowledge, you end up with things like signature, uh, signature pedagogies in certain disciplines. Um, in, in medicine, they, they do a lot of, um, what do they call it, role play and task based and, and problem based and things like that. Um, then of course, there's the technology uh, knowledge base. And when I say technology, it's in this case, it's the technologies that are applicable to education, to learning, to teaching. Um, so you've got to understand not just that, you know, uh, you know, WhatsApp is a piece of technology, but also when you combine WhatsApp with the pedagogy, what, what is it good for? Where does it fit? How can you use this in your teaching and learning? Um, so that idea of TPAC, that framework, um, been around since 20, 2005, um, I think is a nice piece of uh, theory to have in the background where you're thinking about this combination of your discipline uh, what you know about, you know, most of your trained teachers, I dare say, and you know about pedagogy, but what is often lacking is, I suppose, the knowledge of technology and how that then integrates with all those, those other two elements. Um, uh, Michael Sankey, actually, who's the head of ACODE in Australia, gave a, quite a nice speech recently on um, putting the pedagogical uh, horse before the technology cart. The idea is we might got to make sure we get it the right, right way round. It's about, you know, alignment and things like that. Um, so we think about what we want to do or what we want to achieve. And then we go and think about what tools that might help us achieve that. If we get it in that order, I think we'll be in a much better place when it comes to converting things to online environments. 
Um, there is the acknowledgement, of course, that uh, most institutions supply a set of tools. You have a learning management system, Moodle, Blackboard, Canvas. Um, you might have Zoom. You might have VoiceThread. Um, so there's a certain set amount of tools that are supplied to you. So there's also some boundaries on potentially what we can do. Um, so how much agency or how much choice the teacher has in deploying particular pieces of technology, we'll leave that for another time, but we have to also acknowledge that there are boundaries on what we can do. Um, of course, ideally we want to down that way. <laughs> awesome card, of course, right? Um, now, of course, as I, as I mentioned, COVID come along, it's landed in our laps. Think about what the world was like 12 months ago, right? Where were we exactly 12 months ago now? There wasn't all this focus on online learning. A lot of the time it was just a, it was a nice thing to have and it's something that the edX or Coursera folks do. You know, there was always a MOOC office. There's a, you know, these days there's a MOOCs office or an external student's office um, who dealt with all of this stuff. And many academics were reluctant, I guess, to change what they felt was tried and true methods for centuries. You know, they go into the lecture room, they give a, can, you know, hopefully they'd give a, uh, a rousing lecture to their students and then they'll have you know, interesting discussions in tutorial sessions. But beyond that, the learning management system was a file repository and a multiple choice quizzing system and not much else. Uh, that's about as far as it went. Actually, I've done some analysis on two universities learning management systems in the last uh, couple of years and by far the vast majority of the objects in the LMSs were files, just, you know, put up a PDF, put up a PowerPoint um, and multiple choices in the quiz. That was it. Uh, there were, of course, were a significant minority of people doing really interesting things in the learning management systems, but it wasn't a whole. However, now with COVID, we have an opportunity. Uh, people have realized they've been forced, <laughs> right? Forced at the online space. Um, and it's raising people's awareness of, okay, we've rushed into this, we've done the pivot. And now it's starting to come back, I think a little bit to say, ah, these changes, oh, look, this looks interesting. Now I can try this or what about this? And we need to improve the student learning experience, et cetera. Um, now this brings me to this idea of how we use technology, how we might use technology in assessment. So looking a bit past COVID, do we take the blue pill or the red pill? Do you remember this from the matrix? <laughs> you know, the safe and the brave, <laughs> the safe and the risk. So it's the way, way I sort of see it like this is we can take the blue pill and be safe um, in the sense that we don't try anything particularly new. We just try to stick to the tried and true we stick to the multiple choice quizzes. We stick to one hour broadcasted lectures. <laughs> um, we try and battle through with, you know, discussion forums maybe, or email, but we don't really try and think brave. However, you know, I think there's great potential as the same R kind of suggests that we could potentially transform assessment in new ways. And I mean, again, you know, different people, different folks, different strokes in the sense that some people like to start slow. Others people's, if it's not a revolution, I'm not bothering. <laughs> um, we realize education is, pretends to be a very conservative um, um, business in the sense that, you know, change happens slowly. COVID I think is one of these opportunities where change could happen quite quickly. Um, but there is going to be forces on both sides of this fence. There's going to be people arguing for migration. There's going to be people arguing for transformation. You can actually have both. <laughs> um, migration can be, can be a pathway to transformation. However, it really does mean you need to think really carefully about the technologies that get deployed in constructing or enabling migration because if you start to choose new types of technologies, then what you're doing is you're setting up the legacy systems of tomorrow. And as many people have realized, for example, changing your learning management system from Moodle to Canvas for those institutions who have done that, realize it's a big jump, it's a big change. There's a lot of disruption, there's a lot of work, there's a lot of busy work going on, people have to change all their courses around. So what tends to happen is learning management systems tend to become come, come stuck you end up with one 
And unless somebody's really willing for a huge change and a huge change for what advantage, I might add. <laughs> um, so if we're talking about things like converting assessment, sorry, I'm just gonna cough. Um, okay, so what was I thinking? Converting assessment using things like a, a new exam platform, for example, if we wanna do new examinations in a new way in an online space, um, we might select a new platform. But in selecting that platform, we are putting boundaries around what is possible. So technology choice, I think, is quite important. And um, the webinar by Alan um, Stuart Allen back uh, earlier this year, 6th of May, you can have a look at this really interesting discussion around that, that, that dichotomy. Um, thinking about what I would define as good assessment or doable assessment, um, the combination of authenticity, scalability and integrity. These, I guess, are what most people, well, most people expect scalability and integrity, to be honest. Um, the authenticity or the fit for purpose of the assessment somewhat comes second choice, unfortunately. Um, what I tend to observe in many universities is those people who make the decisions around the infrastructure are often not the coalface teachers. <laughs> um, so sometimes we get a bit of a mismatch between the technology tool set and the desired pedagogical uh, focus or process or techniques, right? Um, so what I'm uh, so I guess what I'm arguing for is, is, is given we're changing, let's think about this carefully uh, as institutions as well as individuals um, so that we can try and work towards the uh, there's a bit of a, there's this tension here. For those of you who know the project management iron triangle of good, quick, cheap, pick two, you tend to only be able to have two of the three. This is what I've kind of observed in the world of assessment in that the, the desirability of authenticity, um, you know, it's rigorous and it's relevant. Uh, often produces assessment designs that are not particularly scalable <laughs> um, and may or may not have integrity issues. Now, you think about the best assessment designs that you've experienced as a learner, and you can be almost sure that the poor teacher didn't get much sleep for the whole semester. <laughs> right? um, so we have to be also aware of, is it scalable? You know, is it doable and cost effective? Because approaches that are too expensive often won't get support by the senior management of the institution. Then we've got the idea of assessment integrity. Yeah. Are we, is it secure? Is it the identity verified? Is it valid, right? Is it verified? That elements are also a strong force, particularly in standardized testing, uh, areas where standardized testing is prominent. So we have these forces playing about pushing and pulling, pushing and pulling, about which way assessment can go, which platforms get purchased, which policies get implemented. Um, and I still, I do think we do need to strive for three of these. But because it's, there's three, uh, we'll talk about the implications in a minute. Um, actually, I've got a little activity I'd like people to do. <laughs> um, we're going to use Mentimeter to vote. So let me just put in, that. Now I've got to go and turn it on. So just excuse me, I'll be, I've got to go and um, find what I did with Mentimeter now. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Hopefully I didn't close it. There it is. Okay, I'm going to present that one. Okay, so hopefully when you go to Mentimeter, you will find there is now an open question. If you type in the code, you will get the opportunity to vote. Okay, now I'm seeing some voting coming. What I'm going to do is stop that screen share and change it to the Mentimeter window. Uh, where did I go? There it is. Share. Okay, so vote away, folks. <laughs> Hopefully you can all see the Mentimeter window coming through. Yeah, let me see if I can get back to text chat now. Da, 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 da. We got some votes. So far, authenticity and integrity is winning the race. 
Integrity and scalability is certainly a solid second. 21 votes have come in so far. Come on, blue, come on, blue. <laughs> you can tell where my bias is, can't you? <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can find the Dex chat. Chat. Come on, folks. Voting, voting, voting. How many people do we have in the room? We have 42. It's 25 of you have voted. Come on, vote, vote, vote. Democracy. <laughs> 16. Type the link in again, just in case you've missed it. Just go to minty.com. Type in that code. Okay, I think we've established a trend. Authenticity and integrity is definitely a winner. And even second, integrity and scalability and authenticity and scalability. That's really interesting. Okay. Integrity, integrity, authenticity, integrity. I'm liking the way you're thinking though. Um, it, it's, it's in some ways it shows you are very dedicated teachers because <laughs> you know, what happens to scalability? Scalability is something around, you know, can I do it with large numbers of students without too, without killing myself every day right, with overwork. So thank you for your dedication folks. All right. I'll put it back to the slides now. Share screen. Uh, where do my slides go? There they are. Okay. Oops, next down. So we've got that tension. As I mentioned with the um, project management iron triangle of good, quick, cheap, pick two, when we're thinking about implementing digital assessment, um, and certainly this, these tensions have been alive and well in the digital assessment projects that I've been doing in different universities. Um, particularly thinking about a broad strategy for a whole university. Um, I proposed a certain method of doing it at UNSW last year before COVID, mind you. Um, and this tension was definitely there. Um, in my mind, it, okay, so the Australian context may be different to Hong Kong, but um, in, in Australia, money is something we don't have anymore. <laughs> um, it was shrinking, but it's just basically vanished now to the point where we've got thousands of academics being sacked in Australia at the moment, losing their jobs. So if institutions want to move forward, essentially what they have to do is they have to do it cheap <laughs> um, because they have no choice, which means we've got the other two to sacrifice, if we will. So if we're given cheap, we can't change cheap and we definitely want good, right? And does anybody want bad crap <laughs> assessment implemented? I don't think so. Um, so hopefully we convince management, we can convince our colleagues that good is the way we want to go. Good as in the previous slide of trying to achieve things like scalability, authenticity and integrity, robust, scalable, authentic assessments fit for purpose. The other one to sacrifice is quick. That means that we have to do things thoughtfully and methodically and it's probably going to take us longer to implement than we, th we would hope, um, at least in Australia. Um, I don't know about Hong Kong. It used to have lots and lots of money they throw at education. Maybe that's not quite the case anymore. <laughs> um, cheap means economically. Yes, exactly. Can we do it in efficient ways? Um, there are certain things that you can trim, but eventually you get down to bone, as they say. Uh, there ain't no fat, the meat's been sliced off and you're just down to bone. Um, in my opinion, Australia is at the bone level at the moment. I don't know about Hong Kong. Um, there's literally not much we more we can cut and hence that's why we're having mass, mass layoffs at the moment. Um, but anyway, that's a different discussion. Um, so let's, let's move on. Authentic assessment is something that I'd like to get your opinions on because you're all English language teachers and what do you think this is? Now I'm going to, of course, have to move on the slide. Hang on. Uh, oops, let me get out of there. Um, uh, move that out of the way too. Right now, uh, go back, and I've got to go there. 
And I'm going to go and present. Let's hope that works. Okay, there we go. So fortunately, it's the same code as before. Just pop it in there again. And what I'd like you to do is go there, put the code in again, type one or two words about what authentic assessment, what does it mean to you in your discipline? I mean, you can put in more than two words if you want, but it's going to do a word cloud. So um, let me just stop that sharing and I'll put it on the other screen so we can see what comes out the other end. There we go, share that. Hopefully you can see. Uh, let me just get back. Yes, okay, we have our first, our first word coming through. Meaningful, outcome-based, real life language, contemporary, meaningful. Yes, good, good. Meaningful is definitely coming up strong there. Unpatronizing, okay, contemporary, worthwhile, useful. Meaningful is still getting a valid, realistic, yep. Meaningful is still getting a good, strong vote there. Let's see if I can get back to the chat box just to make sure everything's going right. We have 17, 19 votes so far. Keep them coming, folks. <laughs> Practical and realistic, yep. Test what is taught. Is that the opposite to teaching to the test? <laughs> Test what is taught. Whilst that's still happening, 22. Come on, folks, half of you got to go yet. Um, test what is taught is an interesting one. If we think about this concept or this idea of teaching to the test, what if we change the test to something that is meaningful, realistic, practical? If our test is no longer a standardized multiple choice quiz or fill in the boxes blanks or, you know, standardized audio recordings, then teaching to the test could potentially become a powerful weapon in our arsenal to reform what we do in the curriculum. Because if our test is really meaningful, really practical, uses everyday words, real world tasks, real world language, right, engagement, then that can have us give us that incentive. In fact, it, I, I think I, my feeling is it opens, it frees people. Um, you know, the standardized test is a little bit like the ball and chain around the convict's ankle. You know? um, whereas if we can change the test, if we can reform that end of the spectrum, then that potentially frees teachers to feel that they can then put in the effort to do much more meaningful, realistic, authentic activities in in the classroom. It's food for thought, perhaps. Okay, we've got, let's just go back to where I was, share screen again, slides. Okay. So thanks very much, folks, for your input. Now, first example. Um, now, all of these are examples that have been implemented in various universities. Um, sorry for the very Australian bias in my examples. Um, that's sort of what I've been encountering at recently, at least. So a really good session um, back in April by the folks in the Griffith University Business School was around this idea of replacing written examinations, written final exams with interactive online oral assessments. Now, when they say interactive online assessments, they don't mean an old fashioned viva with question and answers in it. What they mean is a scenario, a simulation, a authentic task that the student performs via Zoom or Blackboard Collaborate or whatever you happen to have. Um, so it could be defense of work already done. It could be a mock job interview, a mock media interview. Um, given these examples are from the business faculty, you can see they're a little bit uh, twisted in a certain way, but nevertheless, um, pretty much all of those examples, we've got presentation to the board, report to management, shareholders meeting, pitch to a client, um, response to a crisis, <laughs> COVID-19, eh? Uh, there, now there's some great examples of 
good and bad communication floating around. You know, Jacinta Ardern from New Zealand. Now there's a stellar communicator in a time of crisis. How about rallying the country? And we can mention some really crap ones, but I won't <laughs> um, in other regions of the world. But anyway, um, all requires really strong communication skills, right? So I reckon, I think you could use this as an authentic uh, assessment task for lang in language teaching. Now the techniques, of course, in business or in language teaching, we can use the same technology platforms, the same processes and procedures, but of course our content and our rubrics and our assessment criteria will shift and that's fine. So, you know, the Griffith University folks, they, they, they run on Blackboard. They used, uh, I think it was Blackboard Collaborate Ultra and, and Zoom, a combination of those, and they used MS Teams online booking tool. So the combination of those tools, essentially you need an online conferencing tool and you need a booking tool. <laughs> um, if you can manage to scrounge up those two things, um, and most universities has Zoom, and you can always use doodle polls if you must, um, you could create um, online interactive on assessment assist management approach. Now they used tutor teams to handle, they did this in classes up to 300 students. Um, each student got between five and 10 minutes. And of course, the unit coordinator wasn't going to be doing all 300 students. Um, it would take them the whole semester just to get through them. So you have to delegate. And if you're delegating, of course, you're going to need rubrics and moderation and things like that. Now, some additional tips to doing this, um, allowing time for changeover, uh, the swap between, you know, you do uh, classroom based presentations, the student can get up and down really quickly. But in the online environment, there's a bit more coordination to do. We have to make sure people are in the right places at the right time in the digital system. So allowing a bit more time for changeover, allowing a bit more time to it actually takes the task may take a bit longer than the face to face equivalent. Um, a good trip that the good tip that they told me was to have a member of staff in the waiting room. Um, that's able to coordinate with the incoming students um, and they and use MS Teams chat or WhatsApp or whatever other third party tool to communicate with the people who are doing the examinations in the breakout rooms. Um, that way you're able to say, okay, you know, next students are waiting, you know, have you finished yet? And on those kind of things, or I'm taking a bit longer than normal and they just take communicate back to the waiting room to say it'll be another two minutes that you have to wait. Um, so students, of course, may not have done this task. So they're going to need, you know, upfront warning, give them as much warning as you can. Um, we'll, we will have an activity around um, um, helping students to understand the task a little bit later. Um, reassurance, of course. Um, I did a focus group with some students about uh, online exam invigilation last week and their major concern believe it or not, was having strangers look at them in their bedrooms through their webcams. So, you know, the things that we don't necessarily think are going to be important to students can be important. And it means we need to socialize the idea with our students. Um, reassurance, um, telling them what happens to the recordings, for example, who keeps them, how long you keep them. Those kind of things are a concern to students. At least that's certainly been the case in Australia. Um, and give them a practice run, a zero stakes, a no stakes practice run, no marks, just we just do it for practice. That way the students know all the technical steps to get into the system. And that way you minimize problems on exam day. Um, that kind of applies to any sort of high stakes activity, I guess, um, run a practice run. Um, there's a link on the slides. And again, as I mentioned, the slides are available on, <clears throat> on that link I gave you really earlier. So you can find those links. Another one is a virtual work at integrated learning. This is, was developed in the engineering faculty in the University of Western Australia. Um, the idea was that many students fixed number of employers. <laughs> um, and of course, this stuff I think is coming into its own in the era of COVID because, you know, we're not allowed to go to workplaces anymore, but we want to give our students that real world contact. So a combination of simulated um, and remote uh, connectivity with employers, uh, future employers. I'm not sure how much work integrated learning you guys might do in language education, 
Um, you might do it, for example, if you're, if you're training translators and interpreters, but perhaps not in English language, nevertheless. Um, the idea at least gives you a, another avenue to deploy something that's a bit more authentic to get people to practice their communication skills um, in different sort of workplace-based contexts. I'll move on. Another one that, that, has, that I'm quite familiar with is a colleague down at Monash University. Um, we've done some joint work over the years together and he's developed this virtual immersive language learning environment. Um, and he teaches Mandarin Chinese um, in, in Monash University in Melbourne. And the problem was they're having more and more students, um, but less and less opportunity for them to be exposed to the language in China. Uh, in Chinese, in, you know, you go to Melbourne, you might be able to go to the local Chinatown, but um, the restaurateurs in Chinatown are certainly going to get really annoyed at the university for sending their hundreds of students their way. I mean, they might enjoy the extra income from the, from the sales, but, you know, all that communication practice is going to drive them nuts. Um, and of course, you know, getting on an airplane and flying to China is an expensive proposition at the best of times. Um, but we can't do it now anyway. So um, what do you do? So he, uh, uh, Scott Grant built this whole 3D virtual world environment, um, which you can actually download. I'll give you the link in a minute. Um, and it runs on a platform called OpenSim. Um, so he uses it for task-based language learning activities. Um, and the two screenshots there is a task called cook a bowl of noodles. Um, but in order to cook the bowl of noodles, the students have to read the menu in Chinese. Um, they then have to figure out what ingredients they need. They need to figure out the directions to the farmer's market and they have to ask for directions. Um, they need to then transact with the farmer at the farmer's market. That's the picture on the, um, on the left. Uh, yes, left. Um, so, and they actually have to transact in RNB. So you can see this language learning task is much more authentic than I guess what you could contrive in a textbook or even as a role play in a classroom. Because you've got a whole series of different tasks that draw on different vocabulary and different purposes and different contexts. Um, and he has his early years, um, you know, introductory Chinese language students going through this as task-based language learning. Our project together was actually to turn this into a digital exam. Um, now, we didn't do that. We did something else instead um, because money <laughs> was a problem. Um, we did have an idea of how we were going to do it, but we did something a little more simple, which I'll show you a bit later. But yes, you, if you want to hear about, um, we gave a, he gave a webinar back in 2015 about this platform. And he still uses it. Um, but if you go to uh, virtuallyenhancedlanguages.com, uh, you can also obtain the OIR file if you're anyway technically inclined. Um, you can indeed set up your own OpenSIM server on a USB stick and you can try it out. Um, so there's something for the really dedicated, <laughs> but nevertheless. So again, we're thinking about this order of operations. We're thinking about what we might be able to possibly do and how, what sorts of technology can fit. Now I've shown you perhaps one that's doable and two that are maybe not quite so doable for the average Joe uh, in five minutes because you know the virtual world thing, acknowledge, right? That takes a bit of effort to set it up, a bit of expertise, probably technology support people, yeah? Whereas the, the online oral assessment, I think is a much more doable thing that we can do, yeah? Um, we may be able to do simpler versions of this by having role plays through Zoom as well in language learning. So that might be a different way to think about how we could go about achieving uh, the, the stimulation aim, given the fact that we may not be able to get together for traditional role plays anymore. And maybe you don't have the technology skills to set up a full, fully blown virtual world environment. Um, we can also, of course, use tools that we already have got on our hands. Um, every LMS has pretty much got one of these, a blog, a wiki, a forum, and maybe a portfolio if you're extra lucky. Um, then it comes the matter of which tool we're going to use for what. Uh, as it happens, University of New South Wales, my old, uh, my old, uh, one of my old employers, has got a really nice guide for which tool is good for what. Um, now, it, it was designed for Moodle, but 
Uh, I believe Blackboard and Canvas have pretty much got the equivalent. They've certainly got discussion forums. Uh, whether they got wikis or blogs, I can't quite remember. Um, they did it back in the old days when I was still at University of Queensland, we were using Blackboard 9.1. 9 um, however, there is, there is some good guides I've found online. I don't know if people know about the Moodle Tools Guide for Teachers. Um, it's really excellent. Gives you a nice big matrix of all the different tools and what they're really good for. Um, follow this link down here. Uh, I'll paste it into the text chat. Um, oops, where's our text chat gone? <laughs> Okay, hang on. Let me just get the text chat back again. Oh, yeah, paste that in there. I think I also put these on that earlier page too. So if you'll have a look on that page, there's links to tools guides for each LMS platform. Um, now I believe you all got Canvas, Blackboard or Moodle, um, but there's also one there for desire to learn, in case you're curious. <laughs> um, and they're all based on a matrix. So we've got different purposes, and then we've got the different tools across the rows. Um, and they've got recommendations of the which tool fits better and which one doesn't. Okay, let's get on with it. Um, a quick assessment, quick task. Um, it's an individual task for each of you. So go to the tools guide that I've just given you. Um, the short URL is taw.fi slash bwf, but uh, you can find the, uh, the tools guide for all your LMSs with the link that I've just put into the text chat there. That's that link there, LMS tools for teachers. Um, you should find that there is a PDF relevant for each one of your LMSs, or you can choose that short URL that just focuses on the Moodle version of those tools. Uh, oops. HTV, we got to copy the whole thing. So the short URL points to the one from University of New South Wales that's just the um, descriptors, pretty much like the screenshot in the bottom right hand corner there. Um, so give us one sentence. Um, look at the task. Consider that you want to set an online group assessment task for students to review a theory or concept and then discuss with others how it has implications for practice. Now, if your students know what their future discipline is, potentially you could ask the students to pick a theory or concept that they may have learnt, maybe from high school, or you could use a language theory or concept, perhaps that you're trying to teach people. And then you want students to discuss it, how, it, how that theory or concept has implications for the way they do, the way they work, the, maybe the way they speak or write. So out of the selection of those tools, which one is good? And maybe why, if you can think of a why. So just type it into the text chat. So the choices are blog, wiki, forum, or portfolio. Let's give you a couple of minutes. Hopefully you're all still there. <laughs> Knock, knock. I see lots of little blank screens and lots of little photos, but not a lot of videos showing up, but that's all right. Anybody busily thinking about it? Or have we lost everybody? A wiki looks like a good bet. Hey, thank you. You have two votes for wikis, all right, good out. <laughs> Everybody's loving wikis, I don't know why. <laughs> Tell you why it's maybe not quite such the best choice, but anyway, it'll work. <laughs> it all comes down to the learning design at the end of the day, actually. A forum, thanks, Darren. <laughs> Linda, Linda's chosen forum. Yes, there are many forms of participation. You are very right. And that's where I sort of hinted it came down to the learning design as well. So that link is sort of going to give you ideas of what each one of those is good for, what particular kind of task that you're going to have.
Now we're getting votes for forum. <laughs> cool. I should just be quiet and let you do it on your own, eh? <laughs> More user friendly, yes, right. You're probably right. You think about actually when you're selecting tools, um, we can't always assume that the students are literate in that tool. Um, you might have heard of that theory around 21st century learners, digital natives, that kind of thing. And I mean, I think that's largely been blown out of the water, to be honest, um, debunked to some extent. Because in fact, the technical literacy of, of <laughs> can be dropping, not increasing. Um, the number of people that don't know how to fix their own computer in this day and age is crazy, considering the fact that we all use them. But then if you think about it, if you own a car or a toaster, you probably just expect bread or forwards and backwards motion. <laughs> um, so people treat technology computers like an appliance these days. We don't, yes, right. Darren, correct. We're, we're cons digital consumers. So students, they know how to use WhatsApp or Facebook, but they may not necessarily know how to, you know, properly format a Word document. They may not necessarily know how to engage in a wiki because the wiki is a bit more of a sophisticated uh, editing interface. Um, and that may not necessarily be familiar to the students. So if we're picking tools, we also need to be f cognizant of the fact that the students may not know how to use the tools and therefore perhaps we need to integrate how to use the tools into the lesson planning as well. Um, and maybe that's something along the lines of learning how to read the instructions or learning how to explain, ask, uh, get students in pairs and get them to explain the instructions to each other. So you could turn it into a language learning activity. Um, so it's not necessarily dead air or dead time in your, in your course as well. Okay, thank you very much, folks. We've got votes for wikis and forums. So as we see by the description, a wiki is best for collaborative work. And what they mean by that is collaborative editing, where you are putting together a document together. So think Wikipedia, you know, it's the global crowdsourced encyclopedia. So a wiki is just a really small version of that. So some class activities might be, for example, to have the students build a common vocabulary where they contribute their vocab items to the wiki platform and therefore everybody gets to see it. And then you're building up the one document over time. A forum, a forum is more like communications. It's a transaction. It, it's, you know, it's ask a question, get an answer, have a discussion. So given our requirement was have our students discuss, then perhaps forum might be a bit better suited. But I'm not going to entirely get rid of the idea of a wiki because we could have the students write up instructions or they could write up Wikipedia articles about how that theory impacts certain practices. So they could build up their own mini encyclopedia, their own wiki uh, in the class. So learning design is important, you know. Learning designers, they're worth their weight in gold, folks. <laughs> okay. Another example, I, more examples, I'm not sure where I'm going for time here. We're probably getting, getting towards the end. Um, you can have students, you know, discussion forums can be used in various different ways. You can even have things like student-led discussions and student-moderated discussions. Um, I'll leave that as an example for you to follow up. Um, I was actually uh, really impressed with some work by Brant Kutzen from Hong Kong Uni. Uh, it's been around for a while. It was called uh, Participation Forum and uh, Bush Graffer was a set of tools to, to analyze discussion forums to help teachers mark discussions. And in fact, Participation Forum was a Moodle plugin that uh, provided a first pass automated marking of discussion forums. Um, I, I really see there's a lot of potential in that. Um, again, money funding <laughs> probably got lost, but I think given now the huge shift to online environments that potentially this is, um, you know, this is something that we could uh, revisit in the future. And now we started, so, okay, we're an hour in, all right. 
Now, thinking about moving up from simple testing, I did sort of allude to this a little bit before about my hate on, um, on standardized testing. Now, to be honest, yes, it has its place. You know, standardized testing does have its place, but I would argue it's been overemphasized. Um, you know, the whole Americanization of the education system towards standardized testing has not necessarily been a positive thing, in my opinion. Um, it's certainly having a lot of negative blowback, negative washback in, in Australia as well. And there's been quite a lot of, you know, uh, protest against the NAPLAN, the national um, NAPLAN testing that they implemented. But anyway, let's think about what we can do in our language classes. Um, Multi-part quizzes, uh, multi-part questions. Your, your standard LMS has got all sorts of different question types. The simple one in uh, a really create, well, I wouldn't say simple, we've got multiple choice, we've got fill in the blanks. Let's just leave those aside because they're boring and they're standard. But what can we do more creatively with this tool set? If you're lucky enough to have Moodle, there's a question called close, which allows you to create quite sophisticated questions. Now, this is an example of a sophisticated question. You can see all the different kinds of elements you could have in the one question. Um, now, what could we do with a closed question? Um, well, here's an essay question. I'll show you the closed question in a minute. This is an example from uh, one of our Chinese language exams at Monash. Um, we had a particular exam, um, um, way of setting up our exams so that the students had access to Moodle and they had access to a, an offline Chinese dictionary application. And this way of running exams actually ran without networks. So we were able to run Moodle exams and not worry about the Wi-Fi dropping out. This exam was done on bring your own devices, but there's a whole lot of other discussion there. Anyway, what we asked students to do is translate. And we wanted to give them some elements of tools of the trade. And typically students would have access to, you know, if they're out in the field, they're not going to be memorizing every piece of language. <laughs> they might use a dictionary. So we thought, well, given their learners, they'll probably want to use a dictionary. Let's give them a digital dictionary. So that sort of allowed us or allowed Scott to change the way he presents his questions and perhaps expect a bit more out of students because now they've got the human capability multiplier of a digital dictionary by their side. So I think this is also an example of using technology. It's, it's probably, you know, substitution augmentation more than anything, but because we're able to provide it in a way that meant we didn't have to worry about network outages, for example, we could also have confidence that this exam would go ahead and be successful. If on the other hand, we had used live network connections for this exam. Yes, they could have the whole internet in theory at their disposal, but we also wanted to make sure it was reasonably secure. So the decisions around whether you give people the whole World Wide Web, which is a tool of the trade, if you've got to admit, or whether we have a subset of those tools of the trade in order to have satisfy that authenticity, scalability and integrity triad. And perhaps this is an example of that trying to that satisficing process. Another one, of course, if we think about multimedia, um, you know, you're probably already using it in your learning. Why not use it in your testing too? We can give them audio prompts, we can give them video prompts, and we can ask students to describe or dictate or what have you. Do you, you know, there's a debate around whether we, we need to standardize all of these audio files or not. But if we think about what is the purpose of this activity, what is the purpose of this test? We want to produce people that it can do, <laughs> that can read, that can write, that can listen. And perhaps having everything terribly standardized in the sense of security, etc. Maybe we can compromise a little bit. Um, but anyway, here's your LMS, plug the multimedia in, use your quiz to collect the responses digitally. And of course, the students don't necessarily need to be in a supervised environment. If this is a formative learning activity, a formative assessment or a lower stakes assessment, um, perhaps this is acceptable. Um, if we get time, we could potentially talk about test security later. Um, here's another example we used and we did a listening test, same platform, uh, Moodle access, uh, audio files, uh, the closed question type where students type responses in, um, because we were seeking specific elements in this case, we could automatically mark the responses. We didn't have to 
you know, uh, if it was a pen on paper test where we played audio in the room and let the students then write it down on a piece of paper, you got to sit there and mark them all. Um, this case, students used headsets. It was on BYOD devices. It was in a supervised classroom at the time. Um, and then students submitted via Moodle. Um, hopefully um, Canvas and Blackboard have got something similar to a closed question. I don't quite remember, um, but you might get lucky. You could probably use a short text response and just break them up a bit more. You know, you might have one sound file per question rather than the five or six where we had in this case. Um, another thing that you might do is get the students to speak their responses. Um, again, if you're, if you're lucky and you've got, um, yep, no worries. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> um, the recording will be available after the session. <laughs> um, students could speak their responses. Um, there's in the, in, the, in the more recent version of Moodle and probably Blackboard and Canvas, I'm not sure, um, the ability for the student to record a three minute audio or video clip um, as a response to a quiz question. So imagine a take home <laughs> uh, speaking test that the students could submit and then all the audio files are gathered together nicely in, a, in, a, in an easy, easy to um, manage uh, approach inside the Moodle quiz. So you could combine a reading test, a writing test, a listening test and potentially a speaking test uh, all in the one platform. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about rubrics. Um, it was sort of the last activity. Um, now I'm fully aware that people probably have done rubrics to death. <laughs> um, I mean, put up your hand if you haven't heard of a rubric. You know, it's done silence, right? So what we're going to ask this time is think about the student engagement side of the picture. And of course, I'm sure some of you are already thinking along these lines, how do I get my students to respond? How do I get my students to understand the assessment requirements, the standards, the criteria, etc.? cetera? Um, it's all in the rubric. Can you tell me folks, how often have you used rubrics for students' understanding of assessment? So that particular emphasis on students' understanding of assessment. Have you used rubrics to help students understand assessment and wrapped any activity around that particularly? Never, sometimes, or often. Quick, type it into the text chat. Often, often. Not in all courses. Okay, sometimes, often. Often is getting the vote so far. Sometimes, often. Yep. Thanks, Eve. It's yes, it's sometimes it's sometimes uh, done in certain places and not others. All right, thank you very much. I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm speaking to the choir here, <laughs> um, preaching to the choir, but um, in my opinion, rubrics have got their good points and their bad points. And I, perhaps we agree with this, I don't know. Um, it can help deliver clarity, but it can also help deliver confusion. <laughs> um, they're a double-edged sword to some extent. Um, they can help deliver clarity to the students and markers. Um, it is quite difficult to write a good rubric. Um, you know, probably we all know that, um, particularly if there's any form of divergent response expected from the students, because some students come up with the best out of the box responses to things. And you think, wow, I never thought of that. And then what do you do with your rubric, right? So, but it can help moderation. It can help the discussion. It can help the students to judge their own performance. And that's where we tip over into the assessment as learning uh, idea. Um, the difficulty of course is of difficult to specify exacting criteria and standards for all sort of eventualities. They work better for convergent responses, not so great for really divergent creative responses. And therefore the way you write your rubric has to be a bit different, I think. Um, Dealing with the creative and expected, difficulty capturing the holistic or the subjective dimensions of performance. Um, rubrics by their nature are reductionist, aren't they? You know, you cut it up into columns and rows, criteria and standards, and each little box describes a little part of it. But what about the whole? What about the whole, the systems thinking, the holistic side of that performance? Um, 
some people I've seen have an extra co extra uh, row on their rubric that says it hangs together. Um, it's whole. It's it it's it comes together. So some sort of holistic category down the bottom, uh, a reductionist holistic category. If that's not a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Um, digital tools, of course, can help us. Most LMSs these days have got them. Uh, they help the efficiency side of the equation. Uh, there's a couple of links there about designing rubrics and a collection of rubric banks, but you probably, you guys are more probably experienced at language rubrics than me, so I'll move on. Um, but in general, students need our guidance. We know that um, by the indication of the text chat, everybody's already engaged along these lines. Um, there's two sort of examples. We can co-develop rubrics with our students. Um, and what I'm trying to get out here is the engagement side. We would rather our students not be merely passive consumers of the rubric, but active creators or active consumers of the rubric. So get them engaged. So if you co-create, then there's a real opportunity for a discussion around what criteria should be used to assess, what looks like a good performance, what looks like a mediocre performance, and frankly, what looks like a really bad performance. Um, you can even use things like online videos. Um, there's plenty of examples of good, bad, and mediocre presentations out there that you can get students to look at and vote on, for example. Uh, which brings me on to the next one, the mock marking exercise. Um, and I'd like us to have a go at that one a little bit, have a discussion about that next. Um, so this is what the mock marking exercise and my proposal for one is anyway. And what I want to do is demonstrate to the students the power of criteria and standards, not just to understand them, but to appreciate why they exist and what their power is in terms of helping them to understand achievement. So first of all, get the students to do off the cuff marking. Don't even show them the rubric. Don't give it to them yet. Give them the sample responses that could be an essay, it could be a video of a presentation. And you can get the students to say, what mark out of 10 would you give this response? And get them to vote. And what you will probably expect to see is a wide distribution on the responses. So use something like Mentimeter or whatever polling tool you want. Maybe you go, you know, tear five point Likert scale or 10 point scale, get the students to vote, how much out of 10 would you get this? And then show it to them and talk about it. Have a quick discussion in the classroom about why did you give that person 10? Why did you give them five? Why did you give them two? Because there will be a wide, wide variety. Then phase two is give them the rubric. Now, you, if you want to co-create it, now is perhaps the discussion between phase one and phase two is where you might start to co-create that rubric. You could well have a draft version of the rubric ready to go. And then you might augment it with student suggestions or you could just give them the rubric, I guess. Um, now we get the students to mark the same presentation with the rubric and compare the distributions, compare the results and have a discussion around it. And in fact, this is exactly the same process that the University of Queensland uses in their tutor training scheme, where we're training novice markers which essentially, if you think about it, we're training our students to be novice markers because everybody has to be able to assess performance, right? It's a professional skill. You gotta know whether you've done a good job or not before you hand it to the boss. Otherwise you could get the sack, right? Could, get, could lose your job. So this is a valuable skill to have. Um, and in fact, you know, the first time I really realized assessment criteria is when I got a, got a job, my first job as a university tutor. So that's what brought it home to me. And I was still a student at the time. So, and I think this activity will help our students get that same insight. So what I'd like to do, um, and we are fast running out of time, admittedly. So we're gonna do a quick five minute discussion in breakout rooms, and then we'll come back. Um, so not 15 minutes, let's do five. So we're gonna shortcut the process. What I want you to look at is the ESLP rubric, which is this link here. So I've just popped it in the chat pack, ELSP. This is an example rubric. It's not perfect. It's just one I found on the internet and cleaned up a little bit. Um, what we want to do is the students present to a client or stakeholder. Uh, they're presenting to the group. Uh, their solution to a problem in a discipline. 
So in other words, traditional kind of presentation that any student would be expected to do in a lot of disciplines these days. But this is the English, it's the second language presentation rubric. And we want our students to understand it. So design a student activity, how would you implement it in your class? What kind of examples, for example, would you give? Um, would it be an essay? Would it be a video? Would it be an audio file? Would it be what? Um, and how would you arrange it? I've given you one answer. It's not necessarily the answer. It's a pretty good answer. So breakout rooms, can we have, um, who's gonna do the breakout rooms? <laughs> Blanche, do you know who's gonna do that? We just need random breakout rooms. Arrange that for us. Okay. You should now have the invite to join your breakout room. Remember five minutes, just have a little chat in this, in, in your groups. Uh, and then we'll be back, in, we'll call you back in five minutes. I'm gonna go later, so I don't join it. <laughs> Um, you should be able to also contact text chat. That should still be available in the um, in the breakouts as well. I okay, guess so how many people have we got in the room? We've got seven people left, and four of us are presenter admin -y people. So. <laughs> Perhaps we've got a couple of lost souls. Attention everybody, you're supposed to join the breakout room if you haven't done it already. Okay, I think we're getting closer, aren't we? We've only got four of us left, I think. So Lucas, are you the one controlling the breakout rooms? You're on mute if you want to speak back to me. Some of the others have disappeared into the breakout rooms. Got four of us left. I don't know if I can control breakout rooms. No, I don't have that functionality. That's all right. Probably should have shown people this slide as well, but anyway. <laughs> So when it gets to 46 past, if you can send the message that says the breakout rooms are shutting soon. <laughs> to those people who are looking at the recording, we're doing breakout rooms at the moment. So sorry about the boring silence. We'll be back to regularly scheduled programming in a minute, I'm sure. So we're at 44. When it gets to 46, if you can call them back, that would be good. So still got another couple of minutes yet. Yeah, no problem. I will call them back in 40, uh, 46. Yeah. Well, it's 8.45 on my side. So it's 45 past according to my clock. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is over there. My yeah. clock on my computer maybe is slightly out. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, 45 now. Yeah, all right, another minute and then we'll call them back. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for your help. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Thank you so much for today. That's, a, that's all right. So how's, how's Australia? Oh, it's not bad. 
Um, the only state that's got any problem at the moment pretty much is Victoria in Melbourne. Yeah. Everybody else is okay at the moment. Um, there's a bit of underground in Sydney. There's a couple of cases popping up randomly every about yeah, once a week. Okay, I call them back now. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. So sorry to the people using reading recording. <laughs> We're just rambling on about COVID in Australia. Um, we shall have people back in the main room very, very shortly. Um, okay, so I'll just leave it on this slide because the next slide will be if we get time. We are getting quite close to the end now. <laughs> we'll see. And here they come. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. You can leave your videos on if you like. It's nice to see your smiling faces. Have a bit of, you know, personal contact <laughs> with the humans on the other halfway around the world. <laughs> okay, we've got 11 people back. Let's see. And they come do, 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 do. They're pouring in now. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back to the world. 23, still waiting for a couple more people. So hopefully what you did do, of course, was decide who was going to tell us the response. <laughs> what sort of activity did you design? What kind of examples did you do? Um, maybe you can tell me what you thought of my idea <laughs> with the double marking system. I mean, was it a good idea? Was it a bad idea? <laughs> 23, and we're expecting a few more back, I hope. Is there anybody stuck in their breakout rooms? Not sure if you can tell or not, Lucas. Do you know if there's anybody still in the breakouts? Uh, no, they're all Every, back. Everybody's back. Welcome back, folks. Welcome back. Okay, what I'm going to do, I think, is I shall stop the share. So I get to see... Here we go. I can see everybody now. Well, I can see names and photographs of people. So that's a positive. So would anybody like to share what you talked about in the breakout room with respect to... Uh, having students understand the assessment criteria. Catherine Lynn, I see a video operating with a tropical background. You've been to Bali or somewhere like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we actually talked uh, um, quite a few of the, this and uh, one of them, uh, one, one of this uh, we mentioned is that we probably can let students do some, uh, use the uh, descriptors, always say they're a uh, root rubrics and then do some peer assessments and then through their uh, evaluation of others' performances, they probably can understand how we are going to assess that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, peer assessment is a good one. Um, of course, when you combine the rubric marking idea <laughs> with something like an online assessment or an online presentation, um, you could potentially do things like have the students vote yeah. um, <laughs> against rubric criteria. Yeah, um, we also, could, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we also talked about maybe we can make a recording and uh, then let the students to watch a video so that we could be able to save some time uh, without really asking them to present it synchronously. Yep, that's yeah. good. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else would like to share? Jane Robbins? You put yeah, up, we kind of looked at it. We said there's too many criteria. So <laughs> if you've got a lot of if you've got a live assessment, you cannot look at that many. You've got to condense them down or get rid of some. So we give it to the students and ask them what did they want to be assessed on and what did they think was irrelevant. Yep, that's that's a good that's a good idea. Yep. Anybody else? Someone from a different group? <laughs> Melissa, were you from a different group? Um, no, I was in the same group as Catherine. Um, okay. Yeah, we were also critical of the rubric itself. Um, too many I pulled it off the internet in five minutes. I thought, yep, that'll do. 
Yeah, no, I, I commented on our experience. We, my colleagues, anyone here might know, we've got actually got a, a, an assessment due this week, a speech, and we've taken it down to two criteria and four levels of performance. And I know that, um, yeah, some of my colleagues, it, it's hard to get your head around, but we're not assessing everything. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is a need. That's a good point. That's a really good point. Because when you, if you're assessing speaking or, you expect, or you're, you're assessing vocabulary or if you're assessing, I don't know, body language, you don't necessarily have to assess everything at once. That's, that's a good point to make no. too. No. Yeah, excellent point. I've had colleagues do things as simple as get like um, create like a close activity of the rubric, you know, take out some of the key words um, and, and have the students sort of identify the qualifier type words that should be consistent at the different levels um, to how mm. you describe performance. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. Anybody else? Not sure how many groups we had when you did breakouts, but... <laughs> Jason Mann, do you want to say something? Well, we 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 have the same uh, well the, the same comment on the the rubrics. Maybe breaking it down to like two or three should be okay because uh, even uh, I mean even Lillian and I we may have to may have to spend like thirty minutes understanding the whole rubric and <laughs> assessing you know each student. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the moderation between the markers, of course, is important. Um, in fact, as an interesting segue um, or side shoot, I should say, um, we ran a webinar on the 7th of October around examiner judgments of performance-based assessments. Um, and 20% of the variation in the mark, and this was in medical, uh, final year medical exams, 20% um, of the mark was due to examiner stringency or the lack thereof, perhaps. So this researcher was doing research around techniques to try and reduce that variation to you know, increase the coherency of the marking amongst the markers. Um, after the experiment, the post test, they got it down to 16%. What that tells me is humans are humans and humans are subjective creatures. Um, so a rubric is only as good as the humans that are using it. But at the same time, a conversation is an excellent way of coming to common understandings and, you know, looking at demonstrations, looking at examples helps the markers, but it certainly helps the students. If you think about final year medical exams, that's the highest of highest stakes, right? And medical school, in that case of a university who will name nameless, um, you can go and watch the video if you want to find out. Um, was obviously accepting this level of variation in such a really high stakes test. Um, I mean, there's only so much you can do to stand. This was an OSCE exam, a structured clinical practical exam um, with multiple stations. Um, but, you know, that sort of tells me that the role of the rubric, the role of the discussion is going to get us so far. And at the end of the day, humans are subjective and we have to, we have to be able to accept, I think, that level of you know, variation. Because in the end of the day, what we're trying to do is assess somebody as being, are they a competent medica? Are they a competent doctor? Are they going to kill anybody? Um, and in language teaching, can they communicate? Can they string words together? Can they write their future assignments? Can they, you know, do job applications? Can they speak to each other? Can, can they listen accurately, right? At the end of the day, we want to produce students, and often who are going to be students, you know, they're in a language center, they're going on to further education. We've got to equip them with a functional, practical outcome. And we're assessing many, many, many slots along the way. So the big picture is that these 20% variations hopefully should smooth out over a while so that by the time we've, we've assessed our students over multiple iterations, that we should be as professional educators come to a conclusion that, yep, Joey Bloggs or Minnie Lamb, he or she is competent at speaking, reading and writing. I would be confident that this student is going to survive in the wider world of their professional degree program. All right. And I think if we can push students out the door with that confidence, we've done our jobs, you know, and I would argue that things like authentic assessment 
is going to give us a much more powerful outcome at the end of the day than trying to teach to some limited standardized test. But, you know, that's my rant for the day, <laughs> if you will. So um, we're now at 8.56, which I assume, how far, how long have we got to go? I guess it's almost about time we wrap up, Matthew. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. What we can do is we uh, let me just show the last slide, which has got some references on it and, and some contact information. Um, where's my slide gone? Uh, there. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put the references slide up just so it gets captured in the recording. As I mentioned, you've got access to this, um, this list if you went to the forming assessment slash HKCPD link, uh, you'll have access to this. Uh, there's quite a few interesting readings in there. One I would particularly highlight, uh, Kay Samble and, and Sally Brown did quite some excellent work. This is all in response to sort of like that COVID pivot. Um, they've got quite a nice collection of papers. Um, and in those papers, they've got a whole bunch of tables of alternatives types of assessment that's not a written exam. <laughs> um, so I highly recommend that um, that is a that is a, uh, uh, as a as a something to follow up. If you only ever read one paper out of this whole list, that one should be nice and useful, give you a lot of nice good ideas. Um, the last one, of course, is my contact information. Uh, feel free to email me at Macquarie University. That's my name with one T at mq.edu. Um, if you want to add me on LinkedIn, you can do that. Go to matthewhillier.com. It points to my LinkedIn. Uh, transformingassessment.com is the international webinar series that I run. Um, there's quite a few links in these slides, plus some upcoming webinars that you might be interested in. Um, particularly this one on the 18th of November by uh, Professor Phil Dawson. Um, he's, he's a real strong researcher in digital assessment in assessment in higher education and particular focus around uh, contract cheating and things like that. Um, so that webinar should be really interesting. Um, the centre where he's from <clears throat> is also running an online conference, um, which I think is free or very low cost, one of the two. Um, the webinars are all free. Um, the Cradle Conference, um, has got quite a nice big lineup of assessment in higher ed sort of speakers there. Um, I think it's free to register. Um, and then you can just go to one or two sessions if you want, um, all online through Zoom. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, yeah, so, you know, the webinars are free. They run every month. Um, uh, I think they're, yes, they're 3 p.m. Hong Kong time. So hopefully that's not too inconvenient. You might be teaching, but they're all recorded. So that's probably just about it. We're at um, 58 uh, to the hour. So, <laughs> Thank so thanks Blanche and Thank Co you. and Lillian for Thank inviting you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Pleasure, pleasure to virtually visit Hong Kong again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'd we'll, we'll love to see you here in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Matthew.